welcome to 1999's Office Space Review and Thoughts Done. I realize this video is long. If you're only interested in review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review, most likely to serve spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so, and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger as soon as I end the review itself. Please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. Content warning and or trigger warning. I'm afraid I have a hard time understanding the distinction, but I do really respect how necessary the terms are, and I want to cover my bases. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie, gaslighting and mental illness, and there's more, but to get into it, I'll have to spoil. So, spoiler warning. Jokes about Nazis stealing pennies from disabled children, prison rape, car accident, failed suicide attempt, arson, heart attack, racism by characters, and the film alike. No more spoilers for the time being. Now, the NBA rated this an R, and the video will be for those above that age. So, yeah. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the subject, in another tab. I won't mind. I streamed this movie and thus did not have to pay money specifically to watch this. I was already paying for the streaming service. So anything negative to say in this video is not out of bitterness. I also not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone worth from making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this video are correct criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, this is only my second viewing. The first viewing was in the year 2005, and I simply haven't had access to it in the time between. That's why so few viewings. The most recent viewing was right before I started recording this video, so that it would be fresh in my mind. And Right. So, the plot. The year is 1999, and the city is not specified. In fact, they are careful to make sure it could be any city in America. A disillusioned and worn out office desk worker gets tired of his work and decides to stop putting any effort into it. And his two best friends and co-workers are fired so they decide they want to get back at the company. Our protagonist is Peter. He tries hypnotherapy in order to better deal with work, but the hypnotist accidentally leaves him in too relaxed a state for reasons too funny for me to give away without warning for spoilers. Now... So, if this is something you've never heard of, it, this, this is a comedy from 1999 made by Mike Judge, previously known for creating King of the Hill and Beats and Butthead. This is his first feature film that isn't animated. The Beats and Butthead one was, was featured, but it was also animated. And you can tell that it's his first, but I'll get into that a little later in this review. And... The concept is catharsis for the cubicle drones. This is about working a terrible job. It focuses on working a cubicle in an office, but you also get some great stuff about fast food places. And I'm going to briefly get into spoilers, so mute and skip ahead if you don't want any spoilers. This is about working for people who fire so many people that they try to figure out what time to fire them to avoid what they euphemistically call an incident. People who don't reward hard work, but do reward treating others badly. You can tell them that you understand the thing they're about to explain to you, and they will then explain it to you as if you didn't. No more spoilers for the time being. If there's a movie that does this better, 
then I don't know of it. And this was definitely worth making. Now, I do hope when I say positive things about movies not held in high regard that I don't come off as an apologist. I'm not interested in being an apologist, but I do think that some movies are criticized unfairly, and so I try and stand up for some of them. Now, this movie is primarily about characters, not really about plot. The IMDb more like this list compares this to Austin Powers 1, which I give an 8 out of 10, and Austin Powers 2, which I give a 7 out of 10, and a bunch of things that I am not really familiar with. So I can't really compare it that much to those. Now, the title and its special significance. According to the dictionary, office space is one or more rooms in a building that provide a suitable environment for office operations. So titling the movie that is basically like calling Star Wars Space War. It describes the subject. And if you work in an office, this is basically saying, this is you. And I think that was really a, a good choice of a title because it really is like just, yeah. I would say that it's, yeah, so I decided to review this because it does such a great job of detailing why people hate working an office job. And the moment that this movie was added to the Disney Plus star service, I immediately knew that I wanted to do a video on it. Now that has been, I don't know, a couple of months, I guess, several weeks at least, because I take a while to, you know, for, for various reasons that I'm not going to get into here, but I immediately wanted to do it. It's, it I've never forgotten this movie in the 16 years between these two viewings. I remembered a lot of the jokes and a lot of what happens in the movie. And really, this is the only reason I hadn't already done a video on this was because for a long time I, you know, I, I try to only do a video talking about something not very long after I watched it or played it or whatever. And I only started doing videos at all in 2009. That's literally the only reason. If not for that, I would have done a video on this, yeah, 12 years ago, probably. Now, IMDb categorizes this as fitting into the subgenres of patronizing and boss from hell. I haven't watched Idiocracy. I doubt I'd have anything to say about it that wasn't said by Jonathan McIntosh, aka the pop culture detective, or Wisecrack. Side note, the pop culture detective just put up a video called Boys Don't Cry Except When They Do. It's excellent. You should watch it. This film actually started out reflecting office culture, and it went on to change TGIF policy. When this movie was made, it described the fact that in at TGIF, they, employees were asked to wear pieces of flair. But because this movie made so much fun of that, TGIF actually went on to drop that from their policy. So that's, yeah, it's, it's, I, I think that might, that, I, I think that's, that's called winning. That's, that's a, that's a victory. If you, make a comedy that makes fun of something that everybody hates and you do such a good job of making fun of it that the people doing it stop doing it that's like I I don't think you can win more than that that's that's the the highest bar and it also led to the what's it called swing line the company that used to make red staplers 
they started making red staplers again because this movie made them so popular. For some reason, at least one reviewer says that this movie has narration. I think he means narrative. It doesn't, even though whether you shorten office space or off screen, as in voice off screen, both come down to OS. So, you know, you could say the OS of OS. I have not played the mobile game because I've read several reviews that said it crashes constantly, but other than that, it, it sounds fun. I can't overstate how good it is that, how, how good of a thing it is that this movie came out before the year 2000. Because Peter is protecting computers against Y2K. I don't know if it was funnier to watch in 1999 when it was just frustrating and, you know, gave a lot of people a lot of anxiety, or if it's funnier to watch today when we know that Y2K ultimately didn't do that much. Although, I suppose some would say that's because people like Peter did their job well, but... <laughs> I get it. Programming, it's difficult. It, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of focus. It sucks. But how was it that those original programmers didn't see the idea of Y2K happening? Like, it just... Yeah, just do more than two numbers, guys. That's, yeah. Anyway, this was written by Mike Judge. Now, I've watched a bunch of King of the Hill. I quite liked it. I'm barely at all familiar with Beavis and Butthead. Not a fan. Well, I enjoyed the couple of games made about them in the late 90s. You know, let's see. There was... I swear I'm not going to say forever on this. Mini Golf. There was one where you stand on the roof of a building and you spit and you have to try to hit the people walking below and then there was one where you're running back and forth across the screen ah, what's the word as a, as a bunch of large items are dropped from above and you have to try to catch the the good items and avoid getting hit by the bad items I mean, the mini golf was the whatever, but the other two were fun. I realized Dilbert is not my ju Mike Judge, but I did used to love that comic and that cartoon show, but now I know the creator's a Trump supporter. And, you know, Dilbert is also a really perfect, like, you know, point, pointing out the absurdism of office culture. I think the moment that a cat and a dog working at an office, you know, they're, they're major characters. They're, they're recurring characters. They're not like one-offs. I think at that point you've really nailed how absurd it can feel to work in an office. Now, obviously, cats and dogs do not work in an office. They're, they're you know, they, they wouldn't be able to type properly. That's the only reason. They, they'd be management potential, I'm sure. But once you once you go there, it really nails how, how absurd it feels. The Drew Carey Show had a lot of great episodes, also about cubicle dwellers. I've never watched any episode of either version of The Office. I've only seen clips in YouTube videos. If I had to guess, I don't think I would find those as funny as I find this movie. But I definitely do get how those two shows do really nail... You know, the, the in this movie, the boss isn't loud and shouting and ridiculous. He's just passive aggressive and he doesn't and he and he doesn't pay any attention to when you're trying to do the right thing. He only notices mistakes and blows them out of proportion. As far as I can tell, there are boss you know, so some of the upper level, you know, characters in in those shows will like shout and get obsessed about ridiculous things and and stuff like that i can imagine that that's some people's experience with with upper management but for a lot of people it really seems like this movie really nails it the the fact that the boss talks like that 
because then technically you can't say he's not yelling at you. He's just calmly saying that it would be really good if you could do this thing. He's not he's not demanding things. He's not he's not berating you. He's being so nice. He's smiling while he's saying it. Granted, his smile and his eyes scream, I'm dead inside, but he is smiling. And and that really gets to the yeah. Now let's see, so Yeah, quoting a few fellow critics here. Perhaps his TV background makes him unaccustomed to the demands of feature-length script. The ending seems almost panicky in its abruptness. Or maybe he just succumbs to the lure of the easy yuck. What began as discomforting sat satire soon devolves into silly farce. The scene where Pete... Right, the following is from Wikipedia. The scene where Peter, Michael, and Samir take their office printer out into a field and batter it to pieces was inspired by a judge's experience with his own printer while writing Beavis and Butthead to America. He told his co-writer, Joe Stillman, that he was so frustrated by it, when he was done with the script, he planned to take it out into a field and destroy it while videotaping the process. Surstet says the whole sequence was largely improvised, but Naidu adds that they were trying to do it in a way that evoked how the Mafia would do it, to someone it wanted to punish or kill. Livingston thus played his part like the Don circling behind Nigel and Har Herman while they struck the blows with bat, feet, and fists. Years afterward, Nigel says he met some actual mafiosi in New York who told him that they were huge fans of the film and the scene was quote unquote authentic. In addition, Fox did not like the gangster rap music used in the film. Rothman told him he had to take it out, and Judge said after production he would do so if the next focus group also disliked it. A young man in that focus group said that the, f the fact that the characters worked in the office but listened to gangster rap was one of the things he liked about the movie, and Rothman relented. And honestly, it's it's perfect. The, the soundtrack is absolutely perfect. Back to quoting fellow critics here. Mike Judge's office space is a comic cry of rage against the nightmare of modern office life. It has many of the same complaints as Dilbert and the movie Clock Watchers, and for that matter, the works of Kafka and the book of Job. It is about work that crushes the spirit. Office cubicles are cells, supervisors are the wardens, and modern management theory is skewed to employ as many managers and as few workers as possible. And another fellow critic, I'm going to throw a curveball your way and talk about anger for a second. Office Space is an incredibly angry film. It's seized with anger. It's filled to the brim with impotent people, mostly white men, whose lives are dominated by anger. They have no release for their anger. They sit numbly while life gives them a good thrashing and do the only thing they can, build more and more anger. Enter Angry Hip Hop, the one source that understands their anger and voices their anger. But even for these people, it is only a minor release because they can't truly let go with their minority-driven hip-hop. Society says they can't. Anger drives Office Space. It's an odd thing to think about, but at its heart, Office Space is one of the angriest movies you will ever find. Another fellow critic. His new outlook on life is, I don't like to work, and I'm just not going to go. Many people feel that way, but Peter puts an end to action. He's living the dream. Scripted by the director, who has clearly made the cinematic equivalent of the battle cry of the disgruntled office worker. If you don't cheer as the guys bust open various office technology, copiers, computers, etc., such a profane gangster rap, then you're not one of the brethren, I'm afraid. Now, as others have also noted, it does feel like my judge wrote enough scenes to last feature length, but they don't all get bigger. You can't, you know, you can tell that he usually does stuff that goes on for longer and doesn't, yeah, there's a significant difference between the the ending of an episode on TV where you know, well, in a week we're getting another episode, and a movie where, you know, this is the only office space movie, and I 
don't really think I wouldn't mind a, subs a spiritual successor, but I don't think a sequel, and not only because it's been, you know, 22 years, I don't think a spiritual, as uh, the sequel, a direct sequel, I don't think would be as interesting. And I do think that if Mike Judge were to make a spiritual successor to this movie, I think it would be a good idea if there were some other people there to help who were more experienced with feature films. Although, again, I haven't watched Idiocracy, so it's possible he got a lot better. Now, the movie handles plot twists well. There are not too many. Arguably one of them is bad, but only one. There aren't too few, and they're not too easy to figure out for the viewer. Now, the, so, yeah, it was directed by Mike Judge, and at times it feels somewhat aimless. Like, you can, you can understand how the, you can understand basically why things go the way they do, but they don't actually get... Yeah, it, 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 to, to an extent, it is a series of vignettes. It's a series of individual funny bits, more so than... Yeah, it, it feels like if you, if you took a bunch of joke scenes from a bunch of episodes of a TV show and stuffed them all into one, you know, the... It, it is a pretty good movie, but some of the best comedy movies really take advantage of the fact that, you know, of the, of the three-act structure, of the feature film length, and this movie just, just doesn't quite. Now, the very first shot of the movie is traffic on the expressway and the first scene we see how agonizingly slow the traffic moves and you immediately realize this is going to be about how soul crushing it is to be an office worker in America. Now so yeah the, the first chunk of the movie we see how bad the average day for office work is through Peter. And the opening titles, as we see the agonizing and slow traffic, it plays this upbeat, I think it's jazz tune that completely contrasts with what we're seeing. It's very appropriate that the movie about how much work sucks starts in the morning before you can get to work because of how much traffic sucks. Waiting for a really long time to do something amazing you can just try to focus on what you're looking forward to, but waiting for a really long time and then doing something you hate, that is soul crushing. Now, the ending, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending. The ending fits with what came before. To an extent, I'm happy with how the movie ends. It doesn't really have Deus Ex Machina, but there is some convenient writing. Now, let's see. Right, so, once again, some Wikipedia. Judge wrote a treatment in 1996 and the script after the first season of King of the Hill. Fox president Tom Rothman was happy with the draft as he was looking for lighter material to balance the event movies like Titanic that dominated the studio's output at that time. He considered it the most brilliant workplace satire I'd ever read. Despite that, Judge hated the ending and wished he could have completely rewritten the third act. And I hate to say it, but it does kind of show. And I would say it's the first 30 to 45 minutes are really great. And then, you know, the film gradually fizzles out and the last bit is not that compelling. And it's... 
There are some really funny things near the end of the movie, but by and large, the last chunk of the movie is not quite as funny, and it does feel very, very rushed. It, it kind of feels like other, other critics have already have also noted that it, it kind of feels like once they were editing the last bit, they kind of realized that the last chunk of the movie isn't that good, so they try to just rush through it as quickly as they can. And it does feel very awkward. Like, it almost feels like it's, like, different people edited the first half and the last third, at least. Quoting some fellow critics, the charms of the first half of Alpha Space, which allowed the audience to overlook the shoddy direction, uninspired action, acting quickly fade, leaving the impression that this is a hollow movie in the credits roll. That's a little harsh, but I can see. Yeah, he's not completely wrong. When Peter actively rebels and is ironically rewarded for his efforts by the head honchos, the picture loses its bite. What began as discomforting satire soon devolves into silly farce. Just when it appears it's going to become a minor classic, it loses its focus in the second half. Firstly, it devolves a plot, develops a plot line of Gibbons and his two colleagues developing a way of yeah, I don't think I'm going to give that away, but yeah, so jump ahead. It's mildly diverting, and the banter between three friends is good, but it's nothing special and lacks the bite of the office based satire in the early stages. And there was a. Yeah, so, someone put in the comment section of that critics site review. 100% agreement. After seeing this, I would always remark when the subject came up, the first 45 minutes were great, hilarious, inspired, the rest not so much. As a result, I've only seen it once. Most of the quotable lines are in the first half, and near the end, it goes off the rails completely. And someone else added, probably all true, but that kind of unevenness is a hallmark of judges' work. He's a brilliant satirist, but a weak storyteller. After Peter is promoted, he hatches a scheme. This subplot grows to the point where it overtakes the entire film. The absurdity of the office environment is no longer the focus. Suddenly, Peter's desire to do nothing is overtaken by a need to get revenge on the corporation. This shift feels alarmingly false. The film attempts to paint the theft as a moral crisis for its characters. Unfortunately, the same characterizations that made the first half of the film comic strip the film's comic strip satire possible makes any attempt to graft morals onto the same characters a huge mistake. Once a plot forms, the film loses the vast majority of its comic zest. The film's ending seems a desperate attempt to tie up the film's hatred of the office environment and its latter crisis of consciousness. It fails on both counts to satisfy. It's often a shame that good ideas go bad when they're translated into a feature-length film. Apparently, this film was based on a series of comic strips that Judge created. As such, the more fragmented and serialized the scenes feel, the more effective they are. The charms of the first half of Office Space, which allowed the audience to overlook the shiny direction. And, yeah. I did not check to make sure I didn't copy anything in my notes. The movie does run out of steam in its plot heavy third act. And, yeah, the plot takes up far more time than one might have preferred. The ending titles let you sit with the ending and leaves you with the same emotion as the ending causes, thus following up on the ending. And, quoting a fellow critic, If nothing else, just hearing Cannabis rap about having his stapler confiscated over the end credits is worth the price of admission alone, and I would have to agree. It's called "Shove This J O B," and that is in in the in the chorus. Take this job and shove it, and yeah. The movie doesn't lose your interest along the way, although near the end you don't, you aren't as involved in it, but you, you know, you still want to see where things go. It's, it's not interest that it loses, it's passion. And, yeah, so to, to yeah, so the, the satire slash parody in this movie 
does not come from a place of love like Mel Brooks parody. It comes from a place of hate like Shrek. Don't get me wrong, I love Shrek, but as a film series, it definitely does hate. It's certainly the first movie. It has been an eternity since I watched the second or fourth, and I haven't watched the third yet. But it works for the movie. The the fact that it hates the the office is not the office this either of the series, the office as the the setting. Which is also, you know, calling those two series the office also says this is what an office looks like. It's it's a Yeah. It's like holding up a, it's, it's like a mirror, basically. Now, the, the cast definitely understood how best to make things work. There are cast members in this who are asked to be convincing portraying something that would require many years of arduous study, and they are convincing. Now... There, the character of Joanna, I, I hate to say it about a female character, but she didn't really need to be in the film. And it, it's too bad because she has some really great lines, but ultimately she's there because they thought that if there was a romance, then that would attract more viewers. That's basically it. Now... A number of the characters are fairly broad. They're they're kind of kind of archetypes, stereotypes, more than like very carefully developed characters. Now you do feel empathy for the characters you're meant to feel empathy for, and we really we love to hate the the Yeah, the, the the manage yeah, manager characters and the CEOs and such. Now the characters are for the most part well written and credible. Some are lashes at certain people by Rick Riot and Mike Judge. Humor is often very good. Many stats at Windows and 95 are great, often accurate. There are many things that just seem thrown in. Several characters have one or two lines with no actual effect on the plot. These have been written out. And Right. Part of the reason I watched this movie in the first place was because I loved John C. McGinley on Scrubs as Dr. Cox, and Deidre Bader on Drew Carey as, let me think, Oswald Lee Harvey, I think is how you, yeah. And, you know, they're, they're both hilarious, but they're, they're not, they're really not in the movie all that much. So, quoting fellow critics, Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times gave the film three out of four stars. Wrote that Judge treats his characters a little like cartoon creatures. That works. Nuances of behavior are not necessary because in the typical world, every personality trait is magnified, and the captives stagger forth like grotesques. Livingston is nicely cast as Peter, a young guy whose imagination and capacity for happiness are the very things making him miserable. If you ever had a job, you'd be amused by this peon to peons, I think. And quoting from our Wikipedia, after casting the Indian American Ajay Naidu as Samir, who had originally been written as Iranian, 
character was rewritten to be Jordanian, and Maggie worked with a dialect coach to get the accent right. John C. McGinley auditioned for Lumberg, but was ultimately cast as Slidell. Judge says that after Gary Cole read for Lumberg, there was no doubt as to who would play him. He made the character ten times funnier. I have to agree. I, I don't think anybody else could play Lumberg other than Gary Cole. And John C. McGinley is absolutely perfect for Bob Slidell. A casting search in Texas yielded Greg Pitts for Drew, but no one who could play the Chachki's manager, so Judge took that role himself. Office Space originated in the series of four animated Milton short films that Judge created about an office worker by that name. They first aired on Liquid Television and Night After Night with Alan Hady, and later aired on Saturday Night Live. The inspiration came from a temp job which he had that involved alphabetizing purchase orders and another job as an engineer for three months in the Bay Area during the 1980s, just in the heart of Silicon Valley, in the middle of that overachiever yucky thing. It was just awful. Peter Chernin, head of 20th Century Fox, where Judge had a deal, wanted to make a film out of the Milton character, inspired by a former co-worker of Judge's in Silicon Valley, who had threatened to quit if the company moved his desk again. You don't want to know what he does at home after work, Judge replied. Instead, he suggested an ensemble cast-based film. Some, someone at the studio responded with car wash, but just set it in an office. Milton was not the only character inspired by someone from Judge's past. During his jobs in Silicon Valley, where he barely made enough to afford his rent, he had a neighbor who was an auto mechanic. Not only did the man make more money, he had flexible work hours and seemed to judge to be much more content with his life and work than he himself was. The neighbor inspired Lawrence, Peter's neighbor in the film, played by Jesus Ray Baker. And IMDb trivia, the studio wanted Matt Damon as Peter, but Mike Judge felt the role should not have star energy. Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson auditioned for the role of Lawrence, while Kate Hudson was considered to play Joanna. Now, those are all, I do think Matt Damon could have played Peter well, but I do agree that the fact, if Matt Damon should have played the role, it should have been before he was famous, and by 1999 he was famous. I don't really know Vince Vaughn, Vince Vaughn from much, I just, he's, he's popular, so I can understand why. Owen Wilson as Lawrence, I like Owen Wilson a lot. I. I don't think he would have been quite, yeah, and I, yeah, there really isn't, there's not really a role in this movie that would have been, that, that would have suited Owen Wilson well, which, yeah, which is too bad, because he's, he's really, really funny. And Kate Hudson, I mean, ultimately the role is so underwritten, there's not much you can add to it. I think Kate Hudson would have done as good a job as Jennifer Anderson does, possibly better. I, I have to admit, I haven't seen, I haven't seen Jennifer Anderson very much. I have seen Kate Hudson do some really great performances. So, yeah. When he was pitching the pro project, Mike Judge arranged a table read of the script for executives at 20th Century Fox and recruited several actors in the series King of the Hill for the reading. Stephen Root read several parts, including Milton. Judge loved his take on the character and cast him to play Milton in the film. And he's perfect. He, I, nobody else could have played Milton in live action as well as... And, and I've seen him play other roles. I know that he's not like that all the time, but he just... He, he completely nails how Milton should sound and look. And, and the mannerisms and the, the muttering and stammering and all the way just perfect. Milton was actually based on a former co-worker that Mike Judge had worked with during his days in, as an engineer. One day, Judge went to the co-worker and asked him how he was doing. The co-worker began talking about how he was going to quit his job because he had been forced to move his desk around too many times. And they, they have something very similar to that in the movie when Peter talks to Milton and it just it sets off this rant. It's, it's like... It's like... 
of a dam bursting. You know, just the moment that you start a conversation with this person, just this mass of of just all this all this frustration that he can't. You know, that he, no, nobody really listens to him when he vents his frustration. Now, let's see. Right, back to fellow critics. The main plot element of Peter's newfound work attitude, or more accurately, his attitude towards work, offers some funny moments, such as his interview with several bean counters looking for any reason to eliminate his position. Unfortunately, it isn't always consistent throughout the production. He often wavers between indifferent confidence and cautious uncertainty, and that discrepancy ruins the overall intended effect. And... Not as good as Peter, simply because her part is extremely underrated and unpleasant, merely as a romantic character, is Jennifer Aniston in Off Teams, Friends, The Object of My Affection, as the similar, similarly disgruntled employee. According to Mike Judge in an interview, he would have liked Bill Murray. But he didn't, you know, the, yeah, the, the studio wanted him for Milton, but he thought that would, yeah, like, it's, it's below him, I think, basically, yeah, and apparently, no, 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 no. So, Ron Livingston plays Peter Gibbons, and once again, quoting fellow critics, Ron Livingston is a little bland by design. He's known as Hank Hill, the straight man for such off-the-wall characters as the cringing Milton Steen, as hilariously servile here as he's hilariously domineering on TV's new radio, or the movie's boomhauer stand-in Lawrence T. Dre Bader, a construction worker who seems a whole lot happier than his next-door neighbor, Peter. In Office Space, we first see Peter, Ron Livingston, a young computer software engineer, bucking his way through morning commuter traffic one inch at a time. First, the lane he's in moves to a halt, so he changes to the next lane, which looks as if it's moving faster. Then, that lane moves to a crawl, while the previous one speeds up. He changes back to the first lane, and the whole thing starts over again. It should come as no surprise that by the time he arrives at the office, he's in no mood for work. Now, Jennifer Aniston as Joanna. Yeah, so, quoting Philip Frank, Jennifer Aniston turns up as a waitress who works at a restaurant where the computer engineers regularly convene. Her twit of a boss keeps stopping her to take up the issue of her on-the-job flair or the shoulders thereof, meaning the amount of silly buttons and badges that are supposed, nay, required to be affixed to her waitress outfit. The boss always takes a circuitous route to get to the point he wants to make, while Aniston's character waits paralyzed and uncertain to find out whether he's actually meaning to tell her she's out of a job. The picture gives us the idea of the idiocy service workers now have to put up with too. But then, after a dead-on build-up, the worst possible thing happens. No payoff. She has some really great lines. She, she's the one who confronts Peter. You know, Peter tells her that he's going to stop working and she points out the problems with that, and when he gets the the scheme, the, the idea for the scheme, they talk about it, and she points out the, you know, yeah, the various issues, and yeah, like, it's, it's really too bad that for so much of it, it's just, like, her character just kind of goes with, you know, like, for sure there's the frustration of the work, but when it comes to Peter, she takes a lot in stride where it would probably have been funnier if but but that's the you know that's the thing if a woman's in a comedy then either she, you know she's she's going along with it because that you know then the the male audience won't freak out or she 
you know, makes a, she, she criticizes a man and a bunch of men in the audience freak out, so, but there are some incredibly funny lines, and a number of them are her lines, like, she really, she's, she, it's not quite deadpan, but she does just, she, she kind of just drops these little, ah, what's it called, like, she, she notes things, more than she, like, she doesn't go off on a rant, she's just like, so what you're saying is this, that, that's stealing, that's just stealing, you know, she, she's really good at, at that, and, yeah. Stephen Root as Milton Wadhams, and quoting from Wikipedia, the glasses Root wore to play Milton had lenses so thick that the actor had to wear contact lenses to see through them. Even so, he still had no depth perception. He had to practice reaching for the state bar and was, as a result, grateful it had been painted red. Swingline provided the state bar after the filmmakers could not get permission to use either the Boston or Bostitch brands from their manufacturer. According to Critic, everyone has worked with the Melton, here played by Steve Rowe to absolute perfection. That weird guy who seems to have zero social skills and a demeanor that makes you wonder if, yes, uh, not gonna read the rest of that line. Anyway, Milton is a mistreated employee of Inatech, forced to move his desk multiple times. The brilliance of the office space script is that he doesn't just get moved, he gets moved to storage level B. Nope, he's not even considered good enough for storage level A. There are so many small moments of office space that work that generate a smile on the face of any American worker. It is impossible not to appreciate how much this movie gets right. Everyone has their own red staple. Gary Cole as Bill Lumberg, tremendously passive aggressive and quoting Philip Renegio, the high point of the film is the character of Gibbons' incredibly smart and obnoxious boss, Lumberg, played by Gary Cole. It works because Cole never falls into the tempting trap of overplaying it into character. He just rely, relies on creating the persona of someone who always acts in a complacent and smug manner who never has to get angry because he knows all those under him are brow-beaten and dispirited and can't fight back. It's a terrific characterization, brilliantly and hilariously played by Cole. Lumber keeps stopping by Peter's cubicle to remind him to pick up a copy of the memo which Peter already has right on his desktop upon which Lumber observes nods tortoise-like and tells Peter, before moving on, to remember to pick up a copy of the memo they have just been discussing. David Herman plays Michael Bolton. He hates the people connect him with the singer. And if, you know, it, in, in this movie, they mention the song, When a Man Loves a Woman. If you get that stuck in your head and want revenge on it, you can replace the lyrics with, When a Van Hits a Woman. He listens to gangster rap to vent his frustration, but he actually is extremely uncomfortable around black people in real life, so he's one of the countless pasty white dudes who pick and choose the aspects of black existence and black culture that they engage with, and just kind of hope that they don't have to deal with the rest of it. In general, the movie clearly really understands the frustrations and priorities of the average straight white employed man in America. Quoting a fellow critic here, Life sucks, laugh it off. The film begins introducing the characters and style of the film as they sit in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on their commute to work. With a blank-faced Peter, Ron Winston, looks out his window to see an old man in a walker inch up on him and eventually pass him as he sits in his car, not moving one inch. Anyone who has done their time in traffic has thought that walking would get them to where they need to go faster than sitting in their car. Judge took this idea and manifested it in this old man hobbling along with his walker, but still passing Peter with ease. Though his face is stoic, his anger is shown a few cars over by Samir Ajayunaidu. As he comes to a halt, he begins to scream indecipherable words and bangs on his steering wheel. There isn't anything that is happening in the scene that is outrageous or screams, this is totally made up. It's extremely familiar, and because of that, it makes it borderline painful to watch because you empathize with the characters, but still you laugh because at least it isn't you. 
However, though it is a realistic situation, at the same time the situation is portrayed as the absolute worst it can be, a little nudge to the viewer that it's supposed to be a joke. This setup is a consistent tool used throughout the film and what sets up its overall tone. Stewart has all the seriousness in the world as he repeatedly speaks about Flair as, if it were as important as employees washing their hands. There are plenty of restaurants that force their servers to wear a costume as a uniform, and plenty of bosses that have chastised their workers about them. When you think about it, these are probably hilarious conversations that no one ever thinks about, except for Judge. This is one of the bigger bits in the film, however, he uses the same approach of taking an unseen detail and blowing it up. And Ajay Naidu plays Samir Nakinanajar, and quoting from the here, has a name that nobody can pronounce, and what is more important, people do not seem to even take the trouble to try. I think that's 100% accurate, and that's, like, again, the movie itself is making racist jokes, but the, yeah, the fact that the other characters, they don't even, like, it, they almost treat it as if you know, the vast majority of the people who try to pronounce his name are white, and many of them are men, and English is their first language. And so there's almost this sense of, I'm not, I'm not really expected to make an effort here, right? I mean, if he wanted me to be able to pronounce his name, he would change it to something, or he wouldn't have been born with a weird name, okay? It's not my fault. Right, oh, in addition to Scrubs, I also want to say Johnson McGinley is amazing on Burn Notice, as well as Scrubs. The dialogue is infinite. There are 83 entries in IMDb's quotes section. The most well-written stuff in the film is probably the dialogue. And when I say 83 entries, if if you don't, if you're not if you're not familiar, if you're not familiar with the IMDb's quotes section, you might think that an entry is that like a line of dialogue. No, one entry can be 20 lines. It's just one entry basically has to be lines that are spoken in a row. You know, you can't make one entry be two lines from completely different parts of the movie unless they're connected very specifically, but they can't be... Yeah, I, I believe that quite covers it. So, yeah, if, if you just sit down and read all of the lines of dialogue, like, I mean, I didn't time it, but maybe 20 minutes of reading just in that, you know, there's... There's a lot. The there's a there's a certain percentage of the of the script that has been written word for word into IMDb quotes section. So yeah. Now, it does the the dialogue conveys characterization well. And according to Wikipedia, McKinley says the film contains many improvised moments. It was like jazz on that set. One example he recalled was, I suppose. Okay, yeah. So the following is a, the following is his quote. One example he recalled was when Paul Wilson and Bob Porter cannot pronounce Samir's last name, Naga Naga. Well, not gonna work here anymore anyway. No more spoilers for the time being. And. The improvisation also helped solve some problems with the script. Originally, Bolton was to refer to the singer he shared his name with as a no-singing asshole, however from the cold. It was decided that the film could not say that since it would imply he did not sing his own songs. So he came up with no talent as clown. Now, the as far as characterization, we see Peter 
both when things were going well, when things were going wrong, and it does a good job. We, you know, we understand his character. Now, something that really stays with me long after watching. Yeah. Yes, the the there are a couple of things that stay with you long after watching. One of them is the office workers taking out their frustrations on some of their computer equipment, and the scene of Peter telling the the these consultants how he really feels about work. Now, cinematography was done by Tim Surstedt. <clears throat> and yeah, it you know the the cinematography it's not great, but it has its moments. Now, but there's this. Yeah, there, there's a, a scene of the the installing of, of some specific software that's very important, and it plays out like Mission Impossible scene or a professional bank robbery or something. In constant slow motion, guys looking around, checking for witnesses, giving each other a few knowing looks, and the attempted slickness of them passing the disc. Pure genius. Now, from Wikipedia, principal of photography, Judge made the transition from animation to live action with the help of Tim Surstedt, the film's director of photography, who taught him about lenses and worked with the camera. Judge says, I had a great crew, and it's good going into it, not pretending you're an expert. And, yeah, uh, one of, uh, a fellow critic says, the cinematography is bland. Mike Judge, you know, talking about that, the, you know, there wasn't a lot for him to, to learn about the different lenses for the cameras. It sounds like maybe he underestimated the challenge and importance of good cinematography. And, you know, the cinematography is one of those things you, it's, it requires both a talented cinematographer and a director who understands the the and and an editor as well. You know, the it's not enough for the for the director of photography himself to be really talented. If the director doesn't understand how to to use the yeah. Now the movie was edited by David Rennie and yeah, so he also edited The Sweetest Thing and The New Guy, and those, you know, so R-rated comedies. The, the editing is basically fine. There are a couple of bits that really, I mean, I already, yeah, I already mentioned that the, 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 Editing has, like near the end of the movie, it starts to like rush through scenes that clearly they felt they had they couldn't cut these scenes because they're important for plot, but they were worried about like you know maybe they didn't think it was as funny maybe they just maybe it seemed like too far away from the whole office working satire thing, but they wanted to trim it down as much as they could, and it does, you know, like, I think there's some chance that the next time I watch this movie, I might stop it, like, halfway through, and just, you know, like, hypothetically, if I didn't have, have to, if I hadn't set the goal that I was going to do a review of the entire movie, there's a chance that I would have stopped watching around the halfway point this time, since I knew that it was just, it wasn't going to get, like, amazing after, yeah. 
now the the editing is really great when they're destroying this printer. I had uh, I had actually forgotten how many cuts there are in it, but it is like it's almost like a little music video, and you know this gangster rap is playing over it, and you know once again the visual like the way it's staged and the acting and such makes it look like it's a mafia don and two henchmen and they're like you know brutally beating someone who has betrayed their trust and it just it works so well to see these you know two two of all three of them are office workers and two of them are pasty white dudes and there's gangster rap playing and you know one of these pasty white dudes is like the body language is that of like a mafia don it's just and they're still in their office you know the the what's what's it called the the suit and and tie which actually there's a there's a college humor music video parody of let's see well ju Justin Timberlake is he the one who did suit and tie not a fan I really he. The thing with Janet Jackson was his fault, and he just let it only hit her, and I have absolutely no respect for people like that. But that song, there's a parody of it. I believe I'm going to just do a really, really quick search, just to confirm so I don't get the title wrong. But the once again, I swear I am not going to spend forever on this. But I just want to make sure that I don't send you right. It is called Office Funny Guy Song. Parenthesis suit and tie parody. Apparently there's also yeah it all if when I did that search I it also found clips from the office but yeah in that music video he makes a reference to Milton in this so you know there's there's a reason for I'm I'm not just finding an excuse to call out yeah it's it's really really funny. It's the the guy who in in the video is the the it's like he's he's the guy who also appeared in a bunch of the Batman with Pete Holmes you know he's the one who he plays Gordon for example and the I think he also plays the Joker at least once and and various he's he's incredibly funny Pete Holmes I I think it's you know. Pete Holmes is the the lead of those, but I'd say he's like the very second, like the co-lead, and he's incredibly funny. And he plays a lot of different roles and plays them all incredibly well. He does exasperation unbelievably well. He's incredibly funny. Now let's see. The there aren't really special effects or stunts in this movie. But it, they weren't really called for, so I, I can't really fault them on that. It's not like there's something where you're like, oh, that really should have been an effect, or that should have been stunts. The, it had a budget of $10 million and the box office was only $12.2 million, but it did get popular on home video, and quoting with all the credit here, this is the funniest movie of the last 10 years, but of course it failed commercially, so thank you, America for supporting crap like The Haunting and Wild Wild West back in 1999 and letting Office Space die at the box office. Seriously, those are two of the worst movies ever committed to film, but they did, yeah, they, they were, they, they got substantially more people to watch than this movie. Yeah. 
Now, the production design is really great. Quoting from Wikipedia, Judge was very exacting in his demands for how the Initech, Initech set looked. That's the company where they work. He said regularly that it had to seem oppressive. The production went as far as screen testing different types of gray cubicles. Judge also wanted the cubicles to be so tall, to, to be tall, so that lumber would have to lean in to be seen from Peter's desk. Considerable effort was also expended to make sure the TPS reports looked realistic. And yes, still Wikipedia. The setting of the film reflects a prevailing trend that Judge observed in the United States. It seems like every city now has these identical office parks with identical adjoining chain restaurants, he said in an interview. There were a lot of people who wanted me to set this movie in Wall Street or like the movie Brazil, but I wanted a very unglamorous, kind of bleak work situation like I was in. And some IMDb trivia. Tchotchkes is a takeoff on the popular TGI Fridays restaurant chain. The TGI Fridays waiting staff wear striped shirts and suspenders adorned with buttons and name tags. The restaurants themselves are frequently decorated with assorted knickknacks and memorabilia. A reference is made to TGI Fridays when some, someone mentions, thank God it's Friday, while at the restaurant. A square peg in a round hole is an idiomatic expression which describes the unusual individualist who cannot fit into a niche in his or her society. At its entrance, the company Initech has a sculpture of a square peg in a round hole. There are a couple of times when things in this movie, they are not played for horror, but they use horror movie camera work and horror movie music stings and it works incredibly well especially because the movie is never actually scary like there, there are a couple of scenes that are where there's maybe some tension but it's not a scary movie even, even when people are getting fired and such there's never like yeah but and and that thus using music and camera work that, you know, from horror movies makes it even funnier because it's clearly not supposed to be, it's not scary for us, it, you know, it's scary for the characters, but it feels, to, to us, it feels so far removed that we can't help but laugh at it. Meanwhile, you know, so yeah. Not a horror movie. Peter himself does have several nightmares. Now, the movie is easy to follow, and it's meant to, and it's a good idea. So the, yeah, the music for this was handled by John Frizzell, and he also handled music for Alien Resurrection, Mafia, I still know which of the last summer, Teaching Mrs. Single, Josie and the Pussycats, 13 Ghosts, and Ghost Ship. Several of these pasty white dudes imagine themselves, wish they were badasses, complete with gangster rap soundtrack to some of their actions, such as the iconic Wrecking the Printer that keeps giving nonsense error message, messages set to Damn It Feels Good to Be a Gangsta by Ghetto Boys. Quoting fellow critic, not only made a satire on office life, but makes comment on white guys listening to gangster rap and inherent racism in the United States. For those who can relate to dying a little every day in a cubicle, this film, this is the film for you. With a judiciously executed hip-hop soundtrack and the same anti-conformist spirit that informs judges' TV cartoons, office space can expect to attract people who aren't old, who aren't even old enough to be stuck in dead-end jobs. Now, the, it utilizes black comedy and blue comedy. Let's see. 
yeah, some, sometimes the, the humor goes to lowbrow and Judge reveals a strong hatred against certain typical types of people, high level executives, popular care, cafeteria workers, etc. I will do using one to the extreme. There's a scene where one such character appears out of nowhere and does something out of character for no actual reason. The the comedy is observational. Not it's not really smart Alec dialogue. Spends a long time on some setups. There is some catharsis in seeing Peter either not work or only put in very low effort, but it does go on for too long. There's some really great running gags. And quoting for a critic, Judge's mockery on the mundane life is frankly not that funny as you might think. It's loosely placed and poorly edited with awkward silences in mid sequences that just don't fit the concept is something to ponder about, but beyond that, it barely moves forward on the terms of storytelling. As far as the irritation and the frustration that it has to communicate, it does that easily and smoothly, and the primary reason for that is that there are tons of neutral things to connect with the audience. And since it frankly depicts your mundane life and mocks it, there are tiny notions and typical sketch gags that you can thoroughly enjoy. So I, I feel like that critic went a little hard on it, but he's not 100% wrong. Let's go with that. The black humor is sometimes funny, but the violent jokes come a bit too close to 1990s reality. Now, there is a little violence, a little sexual material, and a lot of strong language. Now, it's, it's fairly realistic with some exceptions. The pacing is pretty good. Some jokes and gags do drag along. The film lacks the feeling of progression of the plot that most films have and need. The pacing is all laid back and slow, which has the feeling that nothing really happens in the film, leaving you just waiting and hoping for an extra good joke or gag. The movie doesn't really get bigger and faster and crazier as it goes. The pacing... I'm not sure it ever really speeds up. It stays more or less the same throughout, like the, I, I guess near the very end, there's some faster pacing, but basically, and the following shouldn't really be true about a comedy film, the same, you know, or a, a horror movie, or an action movie, or a, a drama. Whether you watch 10 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour, the movie largely feels the same. A lot of the greatest comedies of all time will get especially crazy in the last chunk of it. And that's not really the case for this one. Compare this to Liar Liar, which does great at it, and while I'm not complaining that that claiming I'm not claiming that the movies are exactly the same, they are both about a man who works in an office, which means he has less spare time than he wants, something unusual happens to him that threatens his job security and his bosses treat him badly. I might go more into detail at the start of notes taken before watching, but it's possible. Yeah, but, you know, if you watch that movie, for sure, there, you know, that one, you can, like, it would be, like, like, if, if you're not 100% sure about it, try once. Try to watch one of the last scenes and then one of the first scenes. Or watch the last 30 minutes and then start watching the movie over or something. And you'll really notice. It's a huge difference. Now, the movie is an hour and 30 minutes if you count the end credits. If I recall, it's an hour and 24 if you don't count them. So, yeah, they, they just barely got it to, to feature length. Now, let's see. And it... it does, yeah, you know, the later bit, the, the, yeah, the later bits of the movie are trimmed down very heavily, so it's really only because they have so many good jokes early in the film that it even manages to get to feature length, and it really, it could very easily have, they could easily have ended up with a film that was too short, if, if not for the fact that 
so many of the, the early jokes just play incredibly well. Now, there is some really sexist comedy, and I think we're supposed to be on the side of the sexist at least some of the time. There are not many female characters, and there's not really a, any female character in this depicted in a positive light. Many of them are defined by if they're sleeping with Peter or not, if they're easy, you know, if, and, and otherwise they're maybe irritatingly chipper, like the ones at his workplace, despite the soul crushing nature, physically unattractive, that kind of thing. Several of the office workers could easily have been women instead of men. There are women at the office, but there isn't a single one of them that we're encouraged to empathize with or identify with. They're, they're just there to be irritatingly chipper or like... Yeah, I think that's really all I can say without giving away spoilers, but there's... Yeah. Now, I personally have never experienced racism, so, you know, it is limited what I can offer up in the discussion, so I will just delineate the different elements and let people actually affected by racism decide how they think the film handles it. The, the character of Samir, Naginam, Naginam Najar, experiences that he always gets his last name incorrectly pronounced by others, and we see that he has problems with American grammar. We, the audience, have empathy for him. He is one of the few characters for whom we can really feel empathy. And many in the United States who have unusual names or who have grown up, you know, ESL, can recognize his experience, but at the same time, it is clearly also intended that we as an audience should laugh at these racist tendencies. It did have an actual actor of color in a fairly major role and as a sympathetic character, considering the threat of American office jobs being outsourced to other countries to save money, the movie could easily have cast him as a bad guy, an antagonist, or simply not at all. There are way too many American movies where there are either no minorities represented or the representation is negative. So, once again, I'm not saying for sure that the movie is good or bad at dealing with race. I'm just mentioning all the aspects of it. Now, the best element of this movie is the interaction between the office workers and their supervisors. And it's worth owning. There, there are so many infinitely rewatchable parts. Like, I, I wouldn't necessarily... It's not necessarily a movie where you put it on and you just watch it all the way through. But, like, watching from maybe five minutes in to 45 minutes in, that you can, you know, and, and individual, individual scenes. And... Let's see. The worst aspect is the, the lack of progression. And it, you know, it'll be less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing that. I would say that I, in a lot of ways, enjoyed the movie more on this, my second viewing, even though I remembered almost all of the jokes. Because I knew, you know, the, the first time I was really let down by the fact that it didn't, yeah. And, and, you know, and it's, it, it is, let's see, yeah, because it, it came out, what, two years after Liar Liar, so it could easily have been much more like, you know, I mean, Liar Liar, I think, at least the you know the director and the stars were more established, but then this movie did attract you know they they were considering using established actors at least, you know so yeah. And the worst aspect, according to others, is the ending. 
before I first watched it, I was most worried that it would be too similar to Beavis and Butthead, and the movie exceeded my expectations. It really isn't very similar to that at all. And I was most looking forward to the mocking of office managers, and the movie exceeded my expectations. The movie is... The movie is entertaining to watch. It is... Hmm, is it good as a whole? It's, it's good as a whole. It's not amazing as a whole. It has some amazing parts. Now, the trailers do not give away too much. On YouTube, I found the, I found one that was 2 minutes and 25 seconds, and one that was 2 minutes and 42 seconds. Those are just the same. Then I also found one that was 2 minutes and 13 seconds. That one's for the DVD, so it's a little bit different from the other one, but yeah, they're, they're very, very similar. I, I, I know some people don't like the trailer. I think it does a, a good job of giving... it. You know, you get a pretty good idea of what the movie... It, it has a lot of the funniest lines. If you like the trailer, I I would say you'll like the movie as well. Now, if, if there is any misrepresentation, it does make the look, movie look a lot more fast-paced. But, you know, two and a half minute trailer, of course, it's, it's not going to... It's not going to be able to do a good job of conveying, okay, so this movie doesn't look super fast, but it is good. It's, this is not going to happen. And, according to Wikipedia, Judge hated the one-sheet poster that the studio created for Office Space, which depicted an office worker completely covered in post-it notes. He said, people were like, what is this? A big bird? A mummy? A beekeeper? And the tagline, work sucks? It looked like an Office Depot ad. I just hated it. I hated the trailers, too, and the TV ads especially. McGinley, too, felt it looked like Big Bird from the Sesame Street Children series and that he would not go to see such a film. The home release judge was upset that the same image was used, albeit with Milton peeking over the man from behind. The cover and posters do not give away too much, but they, they don't really give you a good idea of what the movie is like, and if you, you know, whether you like the... the cover or posters, and whether or not you like the movie, they're, they're, yeah, but it's, it's one of those things, like, I don't know, I don't know how you do a good poster, how do you take one image, how, you know, how, how do you, what image could pop, possibly represent this movie, you know, like, for some movies, it's, like, I don't know, the, off the top of my head, something that comes to mind are when you look at the covers for the Matrix movies. You know, like, I'm not gonna, like, obviously the one for the, the one for the DVD of the, of Matrix Revolutions is really, really bad. It's, it's very oddly kind of like, it, it feels like it was slapped together really, really quickly. And the one for the second is maybe a little uninspired, but you can look at any of them and they convey the look and tone of a Matrix movie. You know, if, you, if you're showing the Matrix to someone who's never watched a Matrix movie before, who have no idea what those movies look like or sound like, if you showed, like, hmm, let's see. What would be a good way to, hmm. Like, if you, if you showed the, the, right, here we go. If you showed one of the movies to someone who, you know, it's the first time they ever watch it, and you ask them to just, like, doodle something on paper, there's a pretty decent chance that what they doodle comes out looking a lot like one of the covers. I'm not saying they would perfectly recreate it, but I'm saying that really gets across, and I don't know how you do that with a, with a movie like this, so... But, with that said, it's still a bad cover. 
The movie doesn't have a lot of metaphors. It's difficult to understand elements. It's not deep. There's not a lot of stuff to analyze. You don't need to watch it more than once. Really, the only thing you need to know, you know, know and understand before watching the movie in order to fully appreciate it is like the basics of office work. Now, when I searched on YouTube for videos about this movie, I, I found several videos that were quite good. Apparently, like, I, I did the search at the exact right time because Jeremy of CinemaSins very, very recently put out a video about this movie called Everything Wrong with Office Space in 18 Minutes or Less. It's a good help at realizing just how great some of the jokes are because he's pointing out the absurdities of them as if it's a bad thing, not realizing that the jokes are made even funnier. By the, 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 at least two or three of the jokes where I watched his video and he pointed out, well, I mean, logically, if this, this, and this, then this. And I was like, I hadn't realized all of that. So, but yeah, that makes the joke even funnier. And, but, but yeah, you know, there's an off-the-shelf reviews review, it's great. Let's see, then. And. Okay. Actually, I guess, yeah, yeah, there were a couple of Wisecrack and Crack videos. They were, they were fine. I, and I did find the the one one of the office space, you know the the yeah. Let's see, two and a half minutes office space featuring Milton animated, you know. But I haven't watched the original the, the ones that ran on the ones that ran on MTV or if I have, I haven't watched them since back then. Now, this has an 80% on the tomato meter, which just tells you that really, you know, somehow, fresh, you know, certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes does not always mean that it gets, ah, that's the word, that, that, that a lot of people end up watching it. But yeah, 80% based on 102 reviews, and the audience scores. 93% based on over 250,000 ratings. And the critics' consensus is Mike Judge Lampoon's The Office Grind with its inspired mix of sharp dialogue and witty one liners. On Metacritic, it has a 68 out of 100 based from critics, 6.7 6 out of 10 based on users and when I checked, the last user review was from the 6th of June this year. And there were 31 Medic yeah, Metacritic critic reviews and also 31 user reviews. On IMDb, it has a 7.7 7 out of 10 and 679 user reviews. And in the IMDb external reviews section, there are 119 links, and I was able to read around 66. I recommend this to anyone who's worked an office job. If you, you know, I, I watched it on Disney Plus Star. It didn't have any special features there so you know if if yeah now according to Google depending on country you can stream the you know yeah I already mentioned Disney plus star is one place you can stream it other you know some will be able to stream it on Netflix some on Amazon Prime I recommend the reviews written by Roger Ebert and Marianne Johansson 
I rate this seven soul crushing ox jobs out of ten. And that brings us to the spoiler section. Thoughts section start disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and long, but the mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I'll try to talk through your fans video disclaimers. This is a lot of this very standard information. I might keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please note that some specific special meaning may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, from here on out, I am not going to be warning before I spoil something for this movie. If I spoil something else, I will warn verbally and hopefully it's from group. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts, some of analysis, some of its favorite tries not to make jokes. And so, yeah, the section right after this one is thoughts I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, and the like. The section after that is thoughts I have before watching. And so sometimes for these, I try to go into if the movie appears to have empathy for the least likable characters. I don't think this movie does have empathy for, for example, Lumber. So, yeah. My making jokes in this should not so be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad, me wanting to make light of the subject, etc. I seem to find the film as a game of trying to don't ever overanalyze anything I watch and Notes taken while watching. So I'm going to really quickly do one that's out of chronological order. I've been going over in my mind how I feel about when Peter rants about Joanna having slept with Lumber in the car. I mean, at the end of the day, he does look more much more ridiculous she doesn't come out looking that bad from the scene and the fact that he straight up has a nightmare imagining lumber having sex you know so so I don't know but at the same time it is really gross a lot of women are judged for who they have sex with anyway so, back to the start of the movie. Right after Bill Lumber confronts Peter about the memo, the other boss comes up and confronts him, and then he gets called up on the phone about it. Even Samir and Michael Bolton confront Peter about the memo. Every single one of the swings that Peter tells has the feeling that Anne is cheating on her, agrees with him. <clears throat> Not only is Lawrence's answer to what he would do if he had a million two chicks at the same time, he's not even 100% certain that he could make it happen with a million. He thinks he could. And Bill explains how, uh, yeah, Lumberg explains how. Bob is going to help out the company. We see a pan across the people working there, and everyone can see the writing on the wall. Not only is Milton going on about how they keep moving his desk, he's talking to Peter on the phone. He can literally just speak up slightly and keep hearing. And 
and Peter starts shutting down his computer. He manages to wait through the first sad spot on the computer, but then a new one pops up, and then a third one. And the third one just keeps spilling out over and over without moving on. It's just, it's so perfectly made. And I remember Windows 95. I was there. That's not that far off. It's It was ridiculous. I love the horror movie music staying when Peter tries to duck out and Lumberg is right there. It's like it's a slash movie and he's the killer. And Peter asks the hypnotherapist if he can make him not realize that he's a boy. And Anne looks like he just asked if the hypnotherapist could reverse gravity. Something that makes the hypnotherapist's heart attack even funnier is the fact that he wasn't even engaging in strenuous activity or anything. It completely comes out of nowhere. Anne freaks out about the heart attack, understandably so. And Peter just doesn't care at all because the hypnosis worked. So, 23 and a half minutes in, Peter starts not doing work stuff or doing it really poorly because he doesn't care. Peter gets out of bed 3.30 and then he just it keeps going through the messages like five of them are from Lumber. When Peter and Joanna eat lunch together, she kind of has a Julian Nolte thing going on. I, I mean, I guess maybe Julian Nolte... Maybe, maybe this is one of the things that Julian Nolte looked to when developing her comedic persona. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that somehow this movie was impersonating Julian Nolte. Yeah, Julian Nolte. But, yeah, anyway. Neither Peter nor Joanna want to talk about work, their own work. Peter tells Joanna he wants to watch Kung Fu together, and there's a, you know, a Kung Fu music sting plays. Milton manages to hear Bill Lumber talk about firing him. Would you go over a typical day for you? Yeah, even if the very first time you watch this movie you didn't know what Peter was about to say you still get a really bad feeling he's gonna say something that's gonna be way too relaxed and not show the kind of dedication to work the company wants and Peter is walking and Lumber tries to talk to him and when Peter just walks past him Lumber is so shocked it takes him almost a second before he reacts to it, like, at first, it just stands there, not moving, like his brain is trying to comprehend that someone who works so far below him just ignored him, so, yeah. The Bobs talk to Bill Lumberg and that other guy, and they're so cruel about firing hard-working people and you know that Bill that Lumber try, starts to you know say yeah he, he says you know uh, I, th I don't think you I, th I think you're really overestimating Peter okay he's been flaking a lot lately he hasn't been doing his work He's also be ha been having some P TPS report problems. It was one time, Bill. It was once. He got he got it wrong once. He was told several times. He was active. He understood. He explained that he understood. He understands it. Leave him alone. Seriously, like it's it's holy crap. One mistake in all that time, and it's just the one thing like. Lumber can't see past it. Lumberg says that he doesn't think Peter should be promoted. And I don't remember which of the Bob, you know, John C. Yeah, Bob C. McGinley looks like he's about to explode. Like, and, and the other one is like, no, 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 okay, okay, calm down. 
I'll deal with this. You know, he 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 looks like he's about to explode. I don't mean figuratively either. I mean literally. I think I can see the fuse. Great montage of Peter not caring. Said to damn it feels good to be a gangster. Peter's literally playing Tetris at his desk while eating snacks. And and Lumber comes up and he's like, So can you talk about so could could we have a conversation? Not right now. I'm actually kind of busy. I'm I might just have to ask you to go and come back later. And Peter tries to break it gently to my. I yeah I I just really briefly. I really love how well he gets along with how well Peter gets along with the bombs. You know the, he comes in for the second. You know it's it's only the second time that they talk that they're aware that he's been skipping work and they're like so we understand you've been missing a lot of work lately well I wouldn't say I've been missing it Bob and they all laugh and it's just it's just it's so funny that like you know he's he's actually he's cape they can they can relate he can relate to them they can relate to him because they don't care about hard work they don't think that they should have to work very hard you know, if you work hard at Inatech, you get fired. Peter tries to break it gently to Mike that he's getting fired, and Bolton thinks his job is secure while Peter is in trouble. So, 48 minutes in, Mike Bolton is learning him, Samir, fired. And, and Samir thinks that he would be lucky to get another job where he could be fired for no reason. And it's it's so great. They're sitting there talking about the plan, and you know, Samir, Michael, Peter, they all agree. We're not gonna tell anyone about the plan. And then Lawrence chimes in with, "I won't tell anyone about the plan either." And and I think it's Mike who like freaks out, like, "What the fuck was that?" And it's just, and once again, I'm when I say freak out, I'm not saying that's an I'm not saying it's the wrong reaction. I'm just describing that's what happened, you know, because it's it's such a it's, yeah. I I mean, probably usually Lawrence just doesn't say anything when Peter has colleagues or friends over at the house. It's only usually when Peter is alone that Lawrence just talks to the wall. Drew tells the others about Tom. We think the story is basically over once he's banging out the driveway, but then the car gets hit. And Drew completely, you know, he he had the completely wrong idea about how the others would react to him doing the, the sex moaning at the office. The destruction of the faulty printer made to look like a mob hit really is a thing of beauty. I love that they have to forcibly drag Michael away from there. He wants to keep hitting the printer. It's really funny when Peter explains the virus to Joanna, her reaction, like, the the lines about like you know she's, she's like so you're stealing and and he says no, no no like about the pennies and she's like for the little handicapped children <laughs> she's just she's so earnest about it like it, it's yeah so you're stealing no you don't understand it's complicated as someone fluent in the language, I can assure you, that is straight white guy for shit, you caught me. Especially if it's a guy saying it to a woman. I mean, I thought the jump to conclusions map was a stupid idea, but honestly now, seeing the prototype, I realize it's completely ridiculous. Good things can happen. I mean, look at me. 
Michael and Samir are asking the lawyer about minimum security prisons, and they found out find out that Peter was completely incorrect. And it really is like it's it's one of those things where again, just the the way that the perception of it is completely different from the reality. Lumber fucker. Let me see who else. Oh no 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 no! You don't have to give any more examples. I love the music, editing, and acting during the Bill Lumberg sex nightmare. I love the n nightmare of Lum. You know, I love that he's still in the same emotional state as always. He's like, if you could move a little to like that's right, yeah, great. And then up comes the coffee cup, and he's like, oh, Peter, hi. I'm gonna need you to come in for Saturday. It's just, it's it's absolutely perfect. And and again, like the music, it's horror movie music, you know. And and the we we get several shots of Drew saying, "Lumber fucked her. She fucked lumber again." Just yeah. And Joanna flips off her boss, and he looks like she threw a gun on him or something. An hour and six minutes in, they realize the virus took too much money too quickly. Michael points out it was Peter's idea with the virus, and suddenly Peter doesn't like the idea of getting them angry at each other. He was fine with it when he thought that Michael was the target. The singing of Happy Birthday is so utterly soulless and passionless. Like, I, I does, that, does it even qualify as singing? I, I think they are just like chanting. It's it's like a chant to an ancient death god, something like "Please do not kill us." It's it's there's there's no sense that they want him to be happy about the fact that it's his birthday. Milton just wants a piece of cake, but he has to keep passing. And then the person right next to him doesn't pass that piece to onto him, so really he should get one. And also, it's a great line, you know, the cake to person ratio is too high. And we see the empty cake container, and the music acts like we're watching a tragedy, like like it's a, a car wreck or something. Just. My cousin's a cokehead. Oh, thank goodness, you had his word there for a second, Bill. Michael, shit. And Bill Lumberg turns off, that's that's why I said Bill, I went ahead by one word. Bill Lumberg turns off the lights in storage room B. And Milton says, okay, that's the last straw. At first, we, the audience, don't believe him because he keeps threatening this, you know. Yeah, he said it 19 minutes into the movie. But he's always saying that this is just, he's always saying it's too much. Peter is still obsessed about Joanna sleeping with Lumberg, but is then relieved to find that it's a different Lumberg. But then he starts worrying they're related. I love the performance of Steve the ex-crack addict so over actually trying to appeal to people like he's 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 saying the words almost as if like he's been he's been cursed by a witch and like if he doesn't say these exact words he will turn into a frog but he doesn't care about these words hello my name is steve i'm an ex crack addict and it ruined my life would you like to buy some magazine subscriptions it's just, wow. And it's apparently, like, the actor based it on how his, like, niece was going around selling Girl Scout cookies. And they find out that Steven is a software engineer, and he's actually like, I thought the ex crank addict thing was more exciting, you know. And then he blackmails. Oh, we actually know a lot of the same people. You're not going to tell anyone about that. But that all depends. It's once once he starts blackmailing them, then he's into it. Like he, you know, it's it's the 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 trying to sell, trying to sell magazines. That's the thing that's yeah. 
an hour and 14 minutes in, and Samir might go a furious with fever, and even Lawrence won't come over. And the nightmare with the judge is also really funny. You're also a very bad person. And hearing a judge use the phrase pound me in the ass prison is just it's just funny. It's yeah. Peter barely gets done admitting to Joanna having gets done admitting that Joanna ha having slept with Lumberg is none of his business before he admits that the reason he's relieved is that it wasn't the lumber he thought. That's the real reason. Wilson just wants his statement back, and at first he walks right past the letter with the confession on the money back. The sight of the building burning, Wilson walking away, and Peter and the audience know that it's him who set the fire, and then Peter laughing at it is hilarious. You know, Cinema since pointed out, you know, I mean, wow, if, like, if you did it at night, in a weekend, then there wouldn't be people in there, and it would be a lot easier for you to get away with it. Yeah, like, him setting the building on fire like that, the way he did, is wild. I think I know someone who'd like this, who might want this. Milton just wanted his freaking red state, but they couldn't even get that. You know, he burned, he ended up burning the building down. He didn't even get the red stapler. Like, I, I, wow. Like, it would be one thing if he at least did get to leave with the red stapler. But, you know, Milton isn't going to contact Peter. He doesn't know he has it, so he's probably not going to get it. That's really, really funny. Wow. So, yeah, the resolution is incredibly abrupt. They didn't end up spending very long on the virus scheme. After it was introduced in the film, if the movie didn't have so many jokes before the real plot started in the movie, the movie wouldn't even have reached the minimum for feature length. It's also too bad that from most of the major characters, their last appearance is not all that compelling. I really have to apply myself to remember most of them. Note here, I'm, I'm not saying here that none of them are compelling. Milton is definitely compelling. And while it's not really something he's doing, the last time we see Joanna's boss, that's also compelling. I suppose. Yeah, I, I think that might actually be them, you know. There's closure with Peter Lawrence, Michael Samir. But considering how funny Lumberg, the Bobs, Joanna, their last appearance really doesn't leave that strong an impression. Like, you, the last time we see Joanna, they could have had a callback to how she was like, so you're stealing? You know, the, the money doesn't belong to you. Well, it, it will, though. You know, all, all this stuff, like, if, after, yeah, if, if when he comes to her and he's like, you know, I'm sorry, I, I did, you know, some wrong things. Like, yeah, like, okay, so let's say that when yeah, when he comes to her, she's like, you know, I think a lot of people at some point in their life considers stealing from their boss. So really the you know he, yeah, and, and then yeah, and then he would say, So it doesn't make me a bad person and then she would add, But most of them don't. Stealing that makes you a bad person, you know, so, something funny there, when, yeah. Now, let's Notes taken before watching. I'm probably not going to go into detail about Liar Liar. I think it would be funnier if Brian didn't flip off Joanna, but instead go really offended at it, the way Lumberg never changed his emotional state. It's funny when Joanna flips off people because it's cathartic, but seeing someone we don't like doing something supposedly offensive isn't funny by itself. And it, like, it really felt like his character would be offended.
the movie ends with Milton, who's been treated badly, taking revenge. We see him on a tropical island, but he's still being treated badly and still wants revenge. And it is a very realistic, you know, joke. It's, it's very difficult to get out of patterns. Humor does not always have to be about truth, but it can be extremely effective when it comes to when, when it does deal in truth. And yeah, I mean, as funny as it is to for Milton to get all the money and to like supposedly get like no one's moving his desk anywhere, no one's taking away his stapler, but he's still upset about you know small things that happen and when he tries to speak up for himself he gets, he still gets ignored. When Peter expresses to the bombs that he does almost no work, we expect him to be fired and replaced with someone who is going to do more work, but instead they promote him. Because having a higher position than he did until then isn't about skill level, how far you got in college, that kind of thing. It's about not being willing to do as much work as those further down the ladder. The bombs are surprised He's already forcing other people to do more work than he does, even though he has the same job as the other people who now have to do his work, the, the work that he isn't doing. So, I found some MD trivia. Milton reveals his intentions to burn down the building 19 minutes into the movie. So it's actually between him saying it and it happening, there's maybe an hour of the movie. During his and Peter's phone conversation, as Peter is trying to clean all his desk to leave, Milton tells him, if they take my stapler, I'll have to, I'll set the building on fire. And that is, literally, you know, he goes in to get his stapler, he goes into the lumber's office, he doesn't find the stapler, he does find the money and the confession, and so he sets the building on fire. When Lumber is having the meeting with the bombs to go over the layoffs, they pull out Lumber's personnel file. In the photo of him stable to the file, he's wearing the exact same shirt, tie, and suspenders that he's wearing while sitting at the table with them. And doesn't he also have the exact same expression on his face? I think it, it does. I, I think he does. I forget. A scene was cut from the film which showed Lumber reacting angrily to his portion being towed. Gary Cole said he was glad the scene was taken out because he felt the lumber character needed to remain at the same emotional state at all times. I agree. And the, there's also... We actually do see the start of it, don't we? It's because he wa he couldn't park at his usual reserved spot because Peter parked there. So instead he parks on the handicapped spot. And so they're about to tow him. And we don't see them tow him, but we do see... Like, they're trying to, to tow the car, and it rips off, I, I don't know what it's called, but part of the back of the car. The PC load letter scene was not scripted. David Herman had more lines to say to Ron Livingston, but he was interrupted by the photocopier jamming and didn't understand what the error message meant. Which is great, because it's one of the funniest jokes in the movie. It's so, it's so honest, it's so real. Right, so the the off the shelf review the guys they said that they didn't find the movie funny the first time they watched it because A they hadn't worked in an office job and B they didn't realize that the movie was go wasn't going to exaggerate the reality of an office job all that much. They say that Jim Anderson isn't amazing in anything, but she feels very real here. And they point out that after a while of Peter making bad life choices, he ends up committing a crime, just like in real life. So you know, some, some good some good points made and you can see why I didn't I couldn't really talk about Huh, actually to be fair, some of that I could have said in the video. Anyway. That's right, I didn't actually have a lot written there. So that's actually everything. So
I have written a sign off. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe. There should be a link to my main channel page and one, two, or more links to relevant playlists on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week. Currently, they tend to come out very similar to this one. So if you want more like this, you're in luck. I hope you enjoy watching as I enjoy watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.